Starship Earth Launch. Hello and thanks for listening. This is an incredible time for space science. For over 100 years, artists of word, pigment, and pixel have been reminding us of what is possible in space. We are finally seeing it made real in our lifetimes. We are the luckiest generation of space enthusiasts in history. One of my favorite scientists, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, was born in Russia in 1857 and died in 1935. He was the son of a Polish father who had been condemned to Siberia. Scarlet fever at the age of 10 left him almost completely deaf and he was forced to leave school. These are terrible setbacks that would stop most people, but not him. He taught himself alone at home until he was qualified for university, where he completed his studies in science and mathematics. He created the rocket equation that we all use today to calculate the changes in velocity produced by rocket engines. Though he never got to see the rockets he designed on paper in real life, in his mind he built rockets, space stations, and colonies. We owe him an unpayable debt as we imagine solutions to space colonization problems and run the numbers to see if these solutions are viable. It is our goal at the Terran Space Academy to help you learn the space science you will need to know to succeed in the space industry. Like Tsiolkovsky, we must be self-taught to a degree. If you went to college for everything you would need to know in space science to survive, you would die of old age before you ever got to space. We want you to have a broad general fund of space knowledge. At this stage, that means being a generalist and not a specialist. A journalist knows something about almost everything important. A specialist knows almost everything about just one something. To accomplish this goal, we try to create entertaining space science education courses. The word academy comes from the name of a Greek hero, Akademos. Plato would walk through a garden in Athens that was named for this hero. As he and his students asked each other questions, as they had been taught by Socrates, to learn a subject. A big part of learning is asking questions. You all raised some excellent questions about the last several lectures and we want to give these the attention they deserve. In this lesson we will evaluate trying to launch the next generation starship from Earth while analyzing the current starship design so that we can see how it will work and have a more complete understanding of multi-stage rockets. Some of you raised excellent questions about the last several lectures. While we work the equations and calculate what's needed to explore and colonize space, let's appreciate a beautiful work of art. No matter how well I describe a ship, it is not the same as seeing one. SpaceX was the first space company to allow the world to participate in their mission to make this dream possible. By showing us all, in real time, the amount of construction, testing, and failure required to develop a true spaceship, we can appreciate the progress they are making, and we cheer every successful test. In this lesson, we will first work through how a multi-stage rocket like the Starship gets into orbit, and see if the next generation Starship could launch from Earth. We will then answer some very cogent questions asked by different scholars about the last lecture. Finally, we will take a look at a new vision for spaceflight. Let's take a look at the art of spaceflight first, and we'll come back to the math. Seeing images like these makes the possibility of achieving our goal seem real to us. The engineers at SpaceX are brilliant, but we are inspired just as much by the artists that create content like this. Creating computer-generated art so that we can visualize a concept is vital to the understanding of new technology. We had built our massive titanium next-generation starship on the moon. It is intended only for deep space and lunar operations, and never to land on the Earth or Mars, while this beautiful ship launches from the Earth. Thank you, Lab Padre, for these images. One of the questions we were asked was why not launch Starship the next generation from the Earth? Let's take a close look at this concept. The mass of the next generation Starship was 6 million kilograms. The weight of the next generation Starship on the Moon was 9,720,000 newtons. On Earth it would be 58,860,000 newtons. If we were to use the best Earth-based rocket engine, the Raptor, to launch it from Earth with a thrust-to-weight ratio of 1.3 at liftoff, we would need to produce 76,518,000 newtons of thrust. With each Raptor producing 2,200,000 newtons, we would need 35 Raptor engines to get our Starship off the ground. That's just the second stage. To get off Earth, we would need a first stage. Could we possibly build one large enough to lift this that wouldn't collapse under its own weight? To understand these issues, we need to analyze the current Super Heavy Booster and Starship system. 
The current SpaceX Super Heavy first stage is planned to have a gross or total mass of 3,580,000 kilograms, or 3,580 tons. Please note the spelling I've used here. An astute scholar has pointed out that while we do everything in metric in these courses so Americans can catch up with the rest of the world, I was raised in the United States, and old habits die hard. You may have noticed I have been spelling the word ton this way. In fact, a ton is an imperial measurement. In the U.S. and Canada, it means 2,000 pounds, or 907.2 kilograms. This is also sometimes called a short ton or a net ton. A ton in Britain is 1,016.047 kilograms, or 2,240 pounds. Why? No good reason just to keep the school kids from staying too sane. A ton is 1,000 kilograms, or 2,200 pounds. Pronounced ton, I am told, though I rebel from that. This is the metric measure of mass and is equal to a megagram, which I wish they had used instead of ton. It would have made everything so much clearer. Here on this channel we will always use metric, occasionally comparing to imperial for my American friends. For instance, one cubic meter is a cube just a little more than 40 inches or three and a half feet per side. We are trying to prepare you for the future, and the future is metric. I will start spelling things correctly, but remember, when I say a ton, or if I mistype and write ton, I always mean a megagram, 1,000 kilograms, 2,204.62 pounds. Back to the SpaceX Super Heavy. The super heavy mass of 3,580,000 kilograms gives it a weight on Earth of 35,119,800 newtons. It has 28 Raptor engines, giving it a maximum potential thrust to weight ratio of 28 times 2,200,000 newtons, or 61,600,000 total thrust, divided by a weight of 35,119,800 newtons, gives us 1.75. That's a good thrust to weight ratio with a little margin over the 1.7 optimal when launching from Earth. We launched our next generation Starship from the Moon at a thrust to weight ratio of 1.3, but our ship was capable of 1.7. But getting off the ground doesn't mean you get it to orbit. As soon as a large rocket launches, it starts burning hundreds of kilograms of fuel and oxidizer every second, and its mass starts to rapidly drop. The engines have to start throttling back to keep from accelerating too fast and damaging the structure of the rocket. The atmosphere of Earth is resisting the movement of the ship through the air, and we have to be especially careful as we approach and cross through max Q. Max Q is the moment of maximum aerodynamic stress. This is when a rocket is about to go supersonic and is pressing against a shock wave in front of it. As it starts to pass through this shock wave, it has to be careful because parts of the ship will be subsonic and other parts will be supersonic. This can cause different parts of the ship to feel different stresses and it tries to twist and bend the ship. During this phase, a rocket will throttle back and very carefully navigate this shock wave until the rocket is all the way through. This is what destroyed the VSS Enterprise by Virgin Galactic when the co-pilot released the feathering device too soon. And it is what used to tear older airplanes apart when they would go into a dive in World War II. And is why the late Chuck Yeager is such a hero for purposefully pushing his rocket plane, the Bell X-1, through that barrier to prove it could be survived. After we are through Max-Q, we can throttle back up and start to make some real speed turning more and more horizontal to get the lateral velocity we will need to stay in orbit. But remember, the Super Heavy isn't just lifting itself into orbit. It has to carry a fully fueled and loaded Starship also. Some of you thought I was too optimistic on my mass estimates for the Starship. I think with the new 304 SS alloy SpaceX has developed, they will get down to an average of 2 millimeters on the skin, but let's go with the current conservative estimates. These estimates are a 100-ton payload mass, a 120-ton empty mass, a 1,200-ton propellant mass for a total of 1,420 tons gross mass with the payload. This is still close to what we had before. I used 80 tons of dry mass, 150 tons of payload, and 1,200 tons of propellant mass to come up to about the same 1,430 tons total. And remember, we are learning to work the equations, not just get one answer. I believe SpaceX will overbuild the early starships then trim them down to the minimum necessary to get the job done, as they perfect the technology. Let's go with 1,420 tons and add that to our super heavy booster mass of 3,580 tons, and we get a total of 5,000 tons, or 5 million kilograms. The Starship first generation with a super heavy booster will have a total weight of 49,050,000 newtons. We need to have a thrust-to-weight ratio at liftoff of at least 1.3. 
the 1.7 is optimal, giving us a minimum thrust of 63,765,000 newtons. Divide that by the force of our Raptors, which again is 2,200,000 newtons per engine, and we'll need at least 29 according to these numbers. Elon Musk has said he thinks they can do it with 28, which would be a thrust to weight ratio of 1.26. So the fully stacked Starship will lumber off the pad, but it is burning a lot of propellant. If the total thrust is 61,600,000 newtons with 28 Raptors, and we know the sea level Raptors have a specific impulse at sea level of 330 seconds, then we can get Sea Star, the characteristic velocity, by multiplying the specific impulse by 9.81, the force of gravity on Earth, and get 3,237 meters per second. We know that thrust equals Sea Star times M dot, or thrust equals exhaust velocity times M dot, and we remember that M dot is mass propellant flow. So we can divide the thrust by C star and get the amount of propellant used per second at liftoff. 61,600,000 newtons divided by 3,237 meters per second equals 19,060 kilograms per second. That means in the first second of firing, this thing loses over 19 tons. We don't know what the burn time will be. But at this rate, the first stage could burn for 179 seconds before running out of propellant if it burned all of the propellant mass of 3,400 tons. But remember that as it gets lighter, it will accelerate to an optimum thrust to weight ratio, then start throttling down. If it stayed at the same power, it would accelerate so fast that the G-forces would tear it apart. Let's see what our total delta V is as this guy tries to get to orbit. Let's also remember that we need to come back and land. Let's check out the crash video for serial number 8. I see the burn starting at about 56 seconds and ending at... Zero 0.8 seconds. This gives us 12 seconds burn time. We can assume that they started the burn on time. And if the fuel flow had not been compromised by low pressure in the fuel header tank, they would have landed. They were burning two engines, so 680 kilograms per second at sea level times two equals 1,359 kilograms per second. Multiply that by 12 seconds, we get 16,310 kilograms, or 16.3 tons. Let's add 50% more as the super heavy booster at 180,000 kilograms dry mass is 50% heavier than the Starship at 120,000 kilograms dry mass. That will give us a little less than 25 tons, or 25,000 kilograms of propellant to land the booster. We'll call it 25. Subtract that from our available fuel on launch and we get 3,375 tons. Now let's get our delta V. Specific impulse for the Raptor engine at sea level is again 330 seconds. If we multiply that by 9.81 meters per second squared, we get an exhaust velocity of about 3,237 meters per second. We know that delta V equals the starting velocity, in this case zero, plus the ejection velocity, 3,237 meters per second, times the natural log of the initial mass over the final mass. We set our initial mass of both fully fueled stages with a payload as 5,000 tons or 5 million kilograms. We have a propellant mass of 3,375,000 kilograms to burn in the first stage. 5 million minus 3,375,000 leaves us with 1,625,000 kilograms at stage separation. 5 million divided by 1,625,000 equals 3.077. The natural log of 3.077 is 1.124. Multiply that by the exhaust velocity of 3,237 meters per second, and we get a delta V of about 3.638. We are definitely not in orbit, needing a minimum of 9.7 kilometers per second to get into low Earth orbit, accounting for drag and gravity. We need 9.70 kilometers per second minus 3.64 kilometers per second equals 6.06 .06 kilometers per second. Keep that in mind. The dry mass of the booster drops away. That's another 205,000 kilograms total, 180,000 for the booster and 25,000 for the landing propellant. Allowing our second stage, the Starship itself, to launch from a high altitude, fully fueled with a mass of 1,420 tons. If our second stage starts with a mass of 1,420,000 kilograms and has a final mass of 100,000 kilograms for the payload, plus 120,000 for the dry mass, plus enough propellant mass to land, which we already determined was 16 tons, then our final mass will be 236 tons. Our usable propellant mass, according to SpaceX, is 1,200 tons. Subtract 16 tons, and we can burn 1,184 tons of propellant. 
we take the natural log of the initial mass, 1,420 tons, over the final mass, 236 tons, and we get 6.017. The natural log of 6.017 is 1.795. The Starship is now at the edge of space, so we can use the specific impulse of 380 seconds for vacuum engines instead of the 330 seconds at sea level. We multiply 380 seconds by 9.81 meters per second squared and get an ejection velocity of 3,728 meters per second. We multiply those two and get 6,692 meters per second delta V. And there we go. We needed another 6 kilometers per second and we have 6.7. A little safety margin. That is how multi-stage rockets get into orbit. That was a lot of numbers. And I know that the engine efficiency changes with increasing altitude. We would have to use calculus to get exact numbers, and some computers almost certainly. But these are very close, and it is vital that we work the equations by hand and develop a strong understanding of the fundamentals of rocket science. Just like lifting weights, doing it just once will not get us where we want to be. With these equations we can properly evaluate the work of others and check out our own ideas to see if they hold up. Now let's rest our brains until part two and enjoy the beautiful work of the artist Seabass 3D Productions as a starship returns from the moon to land on Earth. Thanks for listening. Part 2 will be out soon, where we run the numbers on getting the next generation starship off the Earth. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Help us out on Patreon if you can. And stay safe. At Astro Proterra.